Please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Okay, uh, I guess it's sort of a give back day uh, in the Asian markets, uh, particularly in the uh, Japanese market. Nikkei now uh, over 1% down, 244 points softer on this uh, Friday as we speak. Mark Franklin, Conning Asia Pacific, uh, joins us at this point in the show. Morning. Morning. And we were talking a little bit earlier as we were settling in for our chat here about your concerns in the Middle East, the power grab. Quote unquote, uh, going on in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's been reflected already in the oil price to a certain degree with no changes to supply. So how concerned are you about what's going on there? Well, everyone's been talking about the corruption clampdown mm -hmm. within Saudi Arabia. But actually, I think the actions beyond Saudi Arabia's border, in particular how its relationship with Iran is evolving, is actually more interesting in, in a not so great way. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a couple of escalatory actions in the last few days. So, for example, the Lebanese Prime Minister making a resignation announcement, but doing it from Saudi Arabia, and then that missile being fired across the border from Yemen by Iranian-backed rebels towards Riyadh airport. And now we've seen overnight the Saudis issue a plea to Saudi citizens to evacuate Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, all of this suggests that proxy escalations of tension are on the rise, which has to be firmer for oil prices looking forward. Right. Uh, well, it's, does it go beyond oil prices? I mean, if, it's, if, it, if this escalates and gets worse and becomes, you know, more entrenched. I think if you go from cold war to hot war, then clearly there might be an impact on broader risk appetite. But I think in the near term, what it does certainly do is, is raise certainly near-term energy prices. Right. Are we going to hot war, in your view? I mean, it's, I, know it's, I know it's guesswork at this point, but do you find yourself uh, adopting a more defensive sort of a stance right now uh, amid the, you know, I guess still unlikely pos uh, potential for that to happen? I think a lot needs to happen before you actually uh, descend into all-out war. What you might see is escalations of proxy battles. So again, within Lebanon, mm. within the Yemen civil war. Um, so there are issues which you would identify first before it becomes a direct confrontation. Mm -hmm. Are we de-risking portfolios right now? Not immediately. I think what we're trying to do is invest around themes. And one of those themes is, is militarization, so an increase in defense spending, mm -hmm. which has been a theme that we've been invested around for a number of quarters now. Right. So you found you, uh, Conning Asia Pacific you found yourself uh, landing on more defense issues, uh, uh, plane makers, drone makers, things of that nature? Basically, not just platforms, so, you know, your typical F-35 platforms, no. but also supplies into those platforms. For example, missile equipment, mm -hmm. missile defense systems. So, yeah, that too. So, for example, cyber security, mm -hmm. um, in, intelligence and information-based systems as well. Do you get the sense, Mark, that, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, uh, look at how the Hang Seng has gone, right? I mean, 29,000 is now the new normal. People are now, honestly... Uh, talking about 30,000, you know, within a, within breath now. Uh, the Nikkei moved from what seemed to be uh, 21, you know, uh, refreshing 21-year highs to a now a quarter century high this year with their move over 23,000. I mean, it looks like people are looking for an excuse to sell, but they don't want to do it just yet. They don't want to be too early out of the door and miss out on the last leg. Yeah, I think there's always that, that sense that there's a fear of missing out. I mean, if you look at Japan and Hong Kong, China in particular, the earnings cycles have been really strong for those right. economies. And uh -huh. there doesn't seem to be any uh, imminent sign of that the, the positive earnings revisions that we seem start to reverse. Right. But if we look ahead three to six months, there is a potential scenario where, let's say, risk appetite takes a backward step. Yeah. And that's if, you know, the lead indicators suggest um, these positive data surprises start to moderate. Mm. And at the same time, more than one central bank is normalizing policy. So you get a, a liquidity squeeze and a slowing in global economy. Right. And that's a fairly positive potent combination for risk assets. Yeah, just give me a quick 10-second uh, uh, narrative on China amidst uh, Trump's visit there. It seemed all about deals, and that's about it, right? Well, I think a lot, of, a lot of talk and not necessarily material change on the ground, so uh -huh. trying to build that personal relationship, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really change you know, things like market access and, uh -huh. and fair competition in the longer term. Okay. Mark, thank you for your time, okay? Have a good weekend. Uh, Mark Franklin, Conning Asia Pacific. Let Gather your credit cards, or actually your mobile phones, uh, and your ePay functions. Alibaba's massive online shopping festival, they call it Singles Day, is tomorrow. It starts tomorrow, this, uh, many, and this year many international brands are taking part as well. Kiko, I think it's going to be a 24-day thing, not a 24-hour thing, if I'm wrong. Let's get the singles thing out of the way. It has nothing to do with singles, okay? I don't know where that, I don't know why that persists. Let's call it Shoparama, okay? Yeah. yeah, it really has turned into a big event, but let's remind our viewers, Bernie, how this all started, because this was back in the 1990s. Uh, you know, this day was created as a, as a response to Valentine's Day, but created for those who are unattached and always uh, celebrated on November 11th, because of course it's 1111. But as you 
pointed out, this has really become a massive shopping festival, really driven by Alibaba. Uh, and it's bigger than Black Friday and Cyber Monday combined. Last year alone, raking in $18 billion. This year, some expecting as much as a 25% growth. And the event is happening in China tomorrow, but the impact goes well beyond with 60,000 global brands now in the fold, including Uniqlo, Zara, Adidas, and Lululemon. E-commerce certainly in focus here, but Alibaba has gone out of its way to incorporate physical retailers this year in the lead-up to Singles Day as part of a broader omni-channel push. Now, the company's working closely with 50 shopping malls in China to set up roughly 60 pop-up shops in a dozen cities. In addition to that, the e-commerce giant transforming 100,000 stores into smart stores that feature a new kind of shopping experience, everything from facial recognition payments to uh, beauty tutorials using augmented reality. And the idea here is, of course, to marry the online and offline experience together. And to that end, Alibaba has worked with these offline stores to upgrade their system so they can track inventory more accurately. And the idea isn't just to sell more, but use those physical retailers as delivery and storage centers. And uh, Bernie, as you know, from covering these events in the past. Uh, this isn't just all about shopping. Alibaba always has some big name stars on hand to really drive mm. uh, the broader festival. And we are expecting Maria Sharapova and Pharrell Williams to be at the Shanghai Whoa. event this time around. Wow, glam, glam. Okay, I'll be there. And I'm I, I definitely going to try to augment my reality with their service <laughs> soon. Thanks, uh, Kiko. All right, locally, Swire Pacific, parent of Cath Ape, uh, issuing a profit warning flagging headwinds at Hong Kong Aircraft Engineering company. Emily's here with more. I thought it was the uh I thought it was the Coca-Cola and 7-Up bottling or something. I guess not. Huh? <laughs> no, this time it's Heiko, the aircraft engineering uh, branch. This is a conglomerate that, that, that does everything from Cathay Pacific. They've got uh, property under their arm as well as beverage, trading, and industrial. Uh, but they have flagged some problems or impairment charges from Heiko, and uh, their weaker-than-expected performance expected to weigh on the company's results. Uh, Heiko taking an impairment charge uh, with Swire's portion, something like six. $60 million of the $80 million impairment uh, that uh, HACO needs to incur. Uh, so that's going to be weighing on the results for Swire Pacific. And uh, HACO shares yesterday traded the day lower almost 1%, 47.75. Uh, Swire Pacific saying the prospects for the other parts of their business being property, beverage, trading, and industrial, Cathay Pacific remain broadly the same. Uh, but this is an update uh, from the first half results, which came out earlier in the year in August. They had already indicated that Cathay Pacific does not expect the operating environment to improve materially in the the second half of this year that also has to do with some fuel hedging uh, they basically put their money on the wrong end of the bet and adversely affected by higher fuel prices as a result of that keep an eye out on all the swire pacific units today when we get up and running in about uh, one hour from now okay uh, mark it down on the well the day the intraday calendar thanks